All right, it is uh, good to see everybody this evening. Got a few more who are coming in over the next few minutes. Um, and uh, we have some who are visiting with us, so uh, it's great to see Steve again, who is with us, and uh, also uh, Jack is here with us, so um, really glad that y'all are here. Jack is just here to shut me up. I keep mentioning to him that he should come by and see us on a Wednesday night while we're doing our Hebrew study, and uh, finally he is acquiescing uh, so that uh, he can rake me over the coals the next time we get together on this, that, or the other. So, uh, we are in Hebrews, and again, uh, we are in danger of falling behind. So, I, I don't want to necessarily spend a ton of time, uh, but we do need to start off with a very brief review just to remind ourselves what's the overall message of this letter? All right, that Jesus is better, yes. Let me nuance it ever so slightly. What is better? All right, it's a comparison of covenants, right? You have the new covenant compared to the old covenant, and they're not equal. Uh, you might have individuals who would say, well, God gave this, God gave this. You're worshiping the same God. Either way, they're equal. And this one comes with persecution. This one doesn't. You know, I'll just come over here and do this. And the Hebrews writer, author is saying, no, you can't do that because this one's better. Because all the way down the line, you've got Jesus, who is better than what over here first? First, the angels, right? First of all, status. They are ministers, ministering spirits compared to Jesus, who has a better name, which is what? The Son. All right, so status first, and then what they do. What did they do? All right, they gave the law, right? The law came through them, but a better law, a greater law, comes through Jesus, right? So you, you've got first the angels, uh, and then Mike said it a second ago, Moses. First of all, status, what is Moses. Did somebody mumble like a steward? Faithful in all of God's house, right? That's the place where he is, but Jesus is what? He's the owner of the house, right? So greater status, and what did Moses do? Remember, status and then action. What was his action? He led them to a what? He led them to a rest, but... Jesus leads to a better rest, right? Um, and so there still remains a rest for the children of God. All right, so you have angels, then Moses, then... All right, then you have Aaron is the point of comparison, and we've been talking about this uh, because over here we, talk, we compared Aaron and Jesus, but really it's kind of a, a comparison of Aaron and... All right, Melchizedek. All right, because the Melchizedekian order is the order through which Jesus is. And remember the whole point of it, it's not based on lineage. It's not based on who your daddy is. You don't have it for a certain period of time, then hand it over to the next guy. The forever of your priesthood is wrapped up in you. That's the way it was with Melchizedek. That's the way that it is with Jesus. Um, comes on to the scene and performs his work until his work is completed, and then he's gone. His priesthood is gone. There's, there's nothing about it that's carrying over. Uh, so Jesus, the forever of Jesus' priesthood, occurs as long as he continues to maintain the work. This gets us then into... Uh, or it gets us through uh, chapter 7 into chapter 8. Um, and then, well, I'm trying to think of what needs to be reviewed. But when, once you get into chapter 8, now we're going to start talking about the actions. Right? Aaron, as far as the high priesthood goes, Jesus, as far as his 
high priesthood go, uh, goes. So we've talked about the Aaronic priesthood versus Melchizedekian priesthood. You get into chapter 9, and really chapters 9 and 10, we're there. This, his, his entire argument, the polemical section of Hebrews, is building up to this right here. And then he's going to hammer his point home about midway through chapter 10. And then the rest of chapter 10, we're going to start getting into the, now this is why it matters. The so what about this. But his argumentation that Jesus is better is going to culminate in the work of the high priest compared to Jesus' work as high priest. And remember last week I said, I want to reiterate this. We're going to start maybe dipping our toes, maybe jumping in and treading water in some of the deeper end of the theological pool. It's okay. <laughs> um, I think everybody here is more than capable of understanding and following through with this. Just know that at some parts of this, it's going to get a little bit heady. Uh, so just be prepared for that. Know that it's coming. And if you have a question, if you want clarification, Take a moment, raise your hand, and uh, uh, you won't be embarrassed by anybody or anything. I won't make a joke of it like I might otherwise. You know, I'll, I'll give you free reign today. You can ask a question without my embarrassing you. Uh, so is everybody okay with that? All right. I mean, unless you really want to be embarrassed, I suppose. Um, so we've ended chapter 8. Really, last week, we, we ended chapter 8, and we talked about the idea that uh, a new covenant was spoken where or by whom? All right, Jeremiah the prophet, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And uh, remember, we said that there were two big differences of the new covenant that's going to come. First one being, you won't have to teach each man his brother, each man his neighbor, saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me, or you will all know him from the least to the greatest, right? So teaching who God is is not going to be a part of the new covenant. Um, you won't have to do that for people who are in the new covenant. We don't have the time to go down that path and talk about it. Maybe someday in Jeremiah we can. For now, though, we're going to leave that behind because it's the second part that the Hebrews author focuses on. And what is that? What's the second difference? Okay, the forgiveness of sins. Kathy, were you going to say anything different? Okay, good, because that was the correct answer. Uh, I mean, no, I'm, wait, I'm not trying to embarrass you. Uh, yeah, no, that was, that was good. Uh, yeah, the forgiveness of sins. That's the part that is going to be really important to the Hebrews author because not only does he have this whole laid out, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 here, but if you look at where his argument's going to end in chapter 10 midway through, he's bringing this up again, right? In chapter 10, verse 16, this is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, write them on their minds, and he adds, and I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. So we've created this inclusio, right? Y'all remember inclusio, the, the idea of bookends, that you have something in the front, something at the end, and that encapsulates, that contextualizes everything in between. So the big difference between the Aaronic priesthood as far as the action done, we've already talked about status, so we move to action, the action of the Aaronic priesthood compared to Jesus' priesthood, the big difference in the action is going to be forgiveness of sins. Now let's see how the Hebrews author unpacks the way that Aaron could not forgive sins and the way that Jesus can forgive sins. Everybody with me? That that's ultimately what we're looking at. Now he starts off and... Um, yeah, he kind of talked about this before and earlier in chapter 8. We, we didn't spend a lot of time, um, but verse uh, chapter 8 and uh, verse 4, if, if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. And verse 5, they serve a copy and a shadow of 
the heavenly things. Um, and so what we, the point he's trying to make here, and, and he goes on to talk about how he got a, a pattern um, when he was on the mountain, Moses did, to construct the tabernacle. So the important part of this, though, is to say it's, it's almost platonic in thought, um, you know, where there is the perfected in the realm, and then this is but kind of a copy of it. Uh, it's kind of a shadow. Be careful, though, of, of bringing too much Plato, um, Plato being the philosopher, not the clay stuff that you would use, right? Just verifying. Uh, be careful of bringing too much of Plato into this, because remember, um, he is not exactly the one that they're drawing stuff off of, right? All of the inspiration's coming, really, from what he reads in the Old Testament text here. Um, but it has that idea that there is something greater. Now, um, if we had the time, we would uh, spend some time really talking about the tabernacle itself. And uh, this is, by the way, not to scale, because I can never draw this properly to scale the way it's supposed to be, and I apologize for that. Um, this room right here, I believe, is supposed to be a perfect cube. So if that tells you how poorly that I have done this, it's really bad. Uh, but you have about two-thirds of it here is going to be for this area, and then you have the final third over here for this area. And, and we always do it like this, don't we? With this, the bigger part on the right, why do we do that? Oh, okay. All right, that's fair. Because the entrance is east, right? The entrance to the tabernacle is east. And so the entrance is over here, out here. Um, you have your altar, and then you have your, uh, the basin, the cleaning basin, the, the water basin. On the inside, you have your, uh, the table for food down here. One, two, three, four, five. I, I think that's it. Um, you have the, the candle stick, the candelabra, the, um, anyway, the, the light source for it. And then in here, what do you have? All right, this is the, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and then there is another um, altar of incense that would be right there. And all of this is kind of set up in such a way that over here, up to this point, really just about anybody who is a Jew can come up to roughly this point so they can hand their sacrifice over to the priest. Can they go beyond that? No, right? Um, who can? All right, so, well, the priests, right? The priests would come in here, and this, this is where the priests operate. The priests do their work. How far can they go? All right, right here. And Josie just called it the curtain. That's important, the curtain or the veil. Um, and, and I failed to mention that, but we would talk about that. And that's as far as they can go. They have to stop right there. They're not allowed to go further. Now, what are the, what's the significance of all of these pieces? We, we talked about this when we were going through uh, John, for those of you who kind of remember that, and those were also kind of evening studies, so you might have slept through those as well. Um, anybody, anybody remember what all of this is pointing to? Okay, the garden, yeah. Th this is all connected to Genesis chapter 2. And the various pieces that you find in, this, is, this has tree language, right, for the candlestick that's there. It talks about almond blossoms and leaves and stuff. You're supposed to see a tree. This is representative of God uh, taking care of, providing for his people. Uh, because remember, the Levites, and, and especially the priests, they weren't allowed to go and work fields, or they didn't have land that was theirs. God provided for them also through the sacrifices. Uh, you have water here, which connects to the river that's found in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, and then you have man and God, because remember uh, 1 
Chronicles 28, I think, is where uh, David says that the Ark of the Covenant is the footstool of God's throne, is the way that they envisioned it. They thought of it. That God's uh, holy place in heaven extends here. This is it's a part of God's throne, is the idea. So God is here with them. And how do we know that God at least wanted them to see it that way? What happened when they built the uh, tabernacle? Yeah, the, you know, the glory of God came down in a cloud and it filled the tabernacle. And then what happened when they built the temple? The glory of God came down and it filled the temple. The first one, not the second one, but the first one got it. Um, that's supposed to represent the fact that God is here with them. But what's the problem? Okay, sin, yes. Josie, I want you to say what you said earlier. What's this? The curtain or the veil, right? Anybody remember what's stitched into the veil there? The cherubim. Why is the cherubim stitched into the veil? Because the cherubim in Eden said, stop, you're not allowed to go in here, right? The cherubim is what kept people out. So as long as the veil is there, with the cherubim stitched into it that says, hey, you're not allowed to come in here. Who's allowed to come in here? Nobody. They're not allowed to enter. All right, so all of that then to set up this first part in chapter nine, even the first covenant had regulations for worship. This is Hebrews chapter nine, in an earthly place of holiness for a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand, the table of, and the bread of the presence, and it's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain, a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim, the glory, overshadowing the mercy seat of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot per uh, perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. All right, so he starts off by enumerating all the stuff we just talked about all of these various pieces that are right here. Um, and, and just as we said, the priests are able to come into here. Now, contrary to what we just read, if I were to ask you, is, is anyone allowed into this place? What's your answer? All right, the proper answer is no. Nobody's allowed to enter there. You're just, it is off limits. It is verboten. You do not go into this place right here. All right, that's, that's the proper answer. Now, the Hebrews author, because he's making his point, is bringing out the exception, right? He says, okay, there is one time of the year that somebody, and, and I would even question the wording, is that somebody allowed to enter here? He has to. Josie was shaking her head, no, and I, I'm with her on there. It's not that he's allowed to go in, it's that he's commanded to go in. He has to go in, and there's a difference. We'll talk about that difference in just a little bit as we start talking about uh, Leviticus 16. We're not gonna turn there, but we're gonna talk kind of about what's going on there because it plays a big role in Hebrews chapters nine and 10. So. Um, he says, this is the way that it was set up. And notice the wording that he gives here. Uh, because right now, remember, 
he's dealing with Aaron and the limitations of Aaron's priesthood, right? What is it that Aaron's priesthood could not do? It could not forgive sins. That's the limitation that's set up, right? So what does he say that it does? Oops, I went back too far. All right, verse 8, according to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. Now, right there, he's given us his terminology he's going to be using. The conscience deals with what now? Someone, did someone kind of say sins over here? All right, when he talks about cleansing the conscience, he's talking about forgiving sins. Uh, he's, he has just set that up by saying, you know, about uh, forgiveness of sins being something that Aaron's priesthood could not do, Jesus' priesthood can. He follows it up now by talking about cleansing the conscience as something that Aaron's priesthood cannot do. So what we know now is that when you talk about cleansing the conscience, that is equivalent to forgiving sins. Everybody follow that? His, his train of thought as you go through here. I make a big deal out of it because there's a really important verse coming up that's all about cleansing a conscience, but I want to make sure that we're understanding what he's doing with that. Uh, verse 10, but they deal only with food, drink, various washings, regulations for what? Whoops. Regulations for what? Yeah, but those are regulations for? The body. Yeah, I was like, it, it, it should be written there, right? These are regulations for the body compared to Jesus. I'm just going to go ahead and put it on there. We'll cleanse the conscience. So it has to do with regulations for the body. What does that mean, regulations for the body? All right, I'm going to try to repeat that back uh, for the folks at home. A lot of the laws that they had uh, were very specifically about what you could or could not touch, um, what you were able to do, not able to do, on a purity, as far as your purity is, is concerned. That is, that you do something that would make you impure, according to the law, and it has affected your body. What has it not affected, though? Your conscience, right? Uh, how many of y'all had a chance to read that bulletin article that I asked you to take the time to read? Maybe a couple of you? I know. I'm putting y'all on the spot, embarrassing some of y'all, sorry. Uh, but I was really hoping that you'd read it uh, because uh, the, the title of it is When a Sin is Not Sinful or something to that effect. Um, and the idea, when we say the word sin, immediately, what do we assume? Okay, further, transgression of the law, but transgression of what law? All right, a transgression of God's moral law. That when somebody, when it says somebody has sinned, what that means is they have violated in some way God's moral law so that the vertical relationship between man and God has been severed and they're no longer in a relationship with God. Is that fair? Except that the Old Testament at least the old law, in the, the covenant itself, it has things that require a sin offering or a guilt offering um, and things that would be considered sinful that do they necessarily violate your vertical relationship with God. One of those things that requires a guilt or sin offering is having a baby. How many of y'all think that it, it is against God's moral law and requiring a, an, a, a sacrifice, a sin sacrifice, because you've had a baby? No takers on that one. How do we know that it's okay to have a baby? Okay. 
One of the very first things that God told man was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right? I, I think having a baby is part of that. Um, so if, if that is the case, then is there anything inherently sinful about God's moral law as far as in regards to having a baby? No, if you have a baby, you don't violate this. But if you do have a baby and you are a, an Israelite living back in the days of, of Moses or, or whenever, are you just fine with that? Is that, is that okay? You just have your baby and then you, move, you go on as if nothing changed? No. no, you have to offer a certain sacrifice. You have to wait a certain amount of time. You have to go through various purification rites, right? It's the same thing when a woman uh, is on her menstruation, there are various things that have to be done uh, in order to purify herself once again. Uh, if you touch a corpse, remember uh, the whole in Numbers, what, 19, I think? Uh, if, if you happen to touch a corpse, there's a certain procedure that has to be done. And is it wrong to touch a corpse? No, unless you're a priest. And even then, you're allowed certain ones that you can. Uh, you know, but otherwise, you have to sometimes, don't you? I mean, that's just the way that it is. When you do it, you have sinned as far as the purity of the people of Israel is concerned. You've sinned as far as the purity of the people of Israel is concerned. Have you sinned against God's moral code? No. No. That is still intact, you know, even if you happen, you know, you're, somebody dies and you pick them up and you carry them to a place where they can be taken care of, right? So, I mean, there's, <laughs> uh, you would expect somebody to do that and then they have to go through certain procedures in order to be considered part of Israel again. Think of it this way, you've got the people of Israel, and then you have somebody who is made impure in some way, and they're kind of outside the camp in that regard, at that point, until the proper things are done, and then they can go and be a part of the Israelite people again. And what was the purpose of the Israelite people as a cultically pure people? Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Remember what he told them? You are going to be a... What's that? Okay, peculiar special. You are a kingdom of priests. A holy or peculiar, a special nation, right? In other words, the Israelites were the priest to all the other nations. And so they had priestly laws that were given to them to make them distinct from the laws of all the other nations. And just like a priest, if a priest were to uh, happen to do this, that, or the other, well, let, let me put it this way. I, I said it earlier. Was a priest allowed to touch a corpse? It had to be a very, very special relationship. And maybe I'm thinking of the high priest in particular. Um, but it could only be immediate family, not in general. Which, by the way, go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. Does it make a little sense why maybe the priest walked on the other side of the road when he saw what could have been a corpse on the side? Because that's what the law said. You're not allowed to touch that. It would make a whole lot of sense for a priest to walk on the other side because they have a set of rules specific to them that the rest of Israel doesn't have, because they're the priests. And it keeps them pure and keeps them holy in a special way. Thus, Israel, to all the other people out there, they have a certain special set of rules that keeps them pure, keeps them holy in a special way that the Hittites didn't have to worry about, the Canaanites didn't have to worry about, Egypt didn't worry about, Babylon didn't worry about, none, none of the others had to worry about that, right? 
They were the only ones that were set apart for this special purpose and had these special laws of purity. So if you became impure, that was sinful as far as the purity of the whole of the people. But then once you made the proper purification, sacrifice, all of that, then you were brought back into the people again, allowed back inside the camp, uh, is one way to say it. Is everybody following? Tracking with what I'm saying here? And I know you're like, all right, are we going to talk about Hebrews now? Or it's coming. I, th this, is, this is the groundwork. This is the contextual groundwork that, that I think we need to have in the back of our minds as we go into chapters 9 and 10. Um, because Aaron's priesthood could cleanse the body. That is, it could make you holy again as a person of Israel. It could bring you, these sacrifices were meant to take people who had become impure and make them pure once again. It could not cleanse the conscience. Does everybody see that? that that's, that's ultimately what he's saying right here by this. Um, so that's why it, verse 11 is important. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, and then through a greater and more perfect tent, one not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more Will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. All right. Um, so some of this we're, we're going, we are going to fly through, don't worry. We're not going to go this slowly through all of this. We just don't have the time to. But some of this is really important for us to get through, especially there through verse 14, because so much of his argument hinges on this. When Christ appeared, um, it says that he, uh, the good things come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. What is that talking about? What is that tent? Any ideas? This one was made by whom? All right, man made this, right? This, this is man-made. This was made with hands. Christ entered into one that was what? Not made with hands. It's not part of this creation. Therefore, let's throw some guesses out there. What might he be talking about? What's that? I, the tomb? Well, the tomb, I think, is still a part of this creation. It's, it's uh, you know, part of, you know, death is part of this creation. It's a good guess. But what is there that's not a part of this creation? This isn't a hard one. I'm not trying to trap you guys. Half his DNA. What? Half of his DNA. Okay, D simple. Someone give me a simple answer, please. Heaven, Heaven thank you. <laughs> All right, right here, right? This is, and when we say heaven, we're not talking about a land somewhere that's demarcated on a map. What are we talking about when we talk about heaven? All right, we talk about the place of God, where God is. It's not of this creation. And what the, he, what the Hebrews author is getting across is that the pattern given to Moses on the mountain was kind of patterned after what? Heaven, right? Am I losing you guys? 
Okay. All right. Well, let me take another track at this then. He is saying that this is what God gave to Moses on the mountain. And he said, get your boys together and build this thing, right? And that's what happens in Exodus. They build this. Where did this idea come from? God gave him this, the Hebrews author is saying, blueprints, a pattern, based off of something else. And he says that that something else is the actual place where God resides. That that's the real one, that this is just kind of a, a copy of. Um, you know, and yeah, you don't really hear much about these anymore, but some of y'all are, some of y'all this is going to be wasted on, I get that, that's fine, so y'all just be young, whatever. But y'all, y'all know what a, a facsimile is, right? Yeah, how many of y'all had to actually send and receive faxes multiple times, and it'd go back, and what happened, like if you were signing documents for a house, what happened every time that that got faxed over there, then back to you, then back, then back? It got bad, like really. At one, you get to the point where you're like, I really hope this says what they say. They say it says because I can't read this. I'm just signing. I'm so tired of this at one o'clock in the morning, going back and forth. I'll sign anything to get this over with, right? I mean, you get this. That's, that's what it is. It's a bad copy. It, it, it's based off of, but it, 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 it's nowhere near what the original intent or what the original is. And that's kind of the idea that, that God says, yeah, heaven is kind of this. But this is a really, really bad version of it, just enough so that you know the idea. Um, and so, let's see here. He entered into this one, um, into the holy places, not by the means of blood uh, of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. Let's talk about that. Um, the Hebrews author, he likes to assume things. He assumes that he's talking to people who know their Bibles really, really well. Um, which is why the whole Melchizedek thing is actually kind of humorous and why I, I said I, I don't think he really thought they didn't know who Melchizedek was. Um, you know, that was just part of his rhetorical strategy to get where he was going. He assumes that you know that all he has to do is talk about the sprinkling, um, let's see, how, how did he word this here? Um, sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer. What is that all about? That chime was early. All right, purification for what? All right, that, that, that was the one where in Numbers 19, if you touched a corpse, then you had to go through certain steps. You know, you had to go through some on the third day, um, and then on, I think it was the seventh day, you know, and in the midst of that, you had to have ashes from a red heifer that had been mixed with water. I'm assuming that they kept stored somewhere, and then you'd take that and sprinkle it. Anyway, it was a whole week-long process that you'd have to go through that involved that. He assumes you know that. He's not going to go back and tell you that. But then what he likes to do is he likes to kind of shove it up with other things. Because then he starts talking about the blood of bulls and goats um, right here for the purification of the flesh. Well, what flesh has he been talking about being purified so far? So far, he's only given, I think, one example of someone who had to take, had to sh shed blood for himself. The high priest on the, what day? All right, Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. So what he's doing, and, and by the way, he's not done yet. We don't have time to go into it tonight. We'll get to it next week. But he's also going to tack it and say, oh yeah, by the way, Exodus 24, where they sprinkle the blood on the people and on the altar, except he's not going to say altar, he's going to say book. But he's like, throw that in there too. Why not? Let's just you know, compile all of these different examples of times where blood was sprinkled where blood was applied in, in these various ways. You had the sprinkling of the blood, Leviticus 16, sprinkling of the, the ashes of a heifer, 
or you know, all of that in Numbers 19, the sprinkling of the blood in Exodus chapter 24 when they entered into a covenant, all of that together, he's going to say, I'm just going to kind of treat that as one thing. And you'll get it. You'll know. You know and <laughs> unless you take the time for us to parse it out, I'm like, well, do we? <laughs> uh, you know, it takes us a little bit more to fill in the gaps that they would have clearly understood. Um, so I do want to, though, in our, our final few minutes, I want to talk about Leviticus chapter 16 and the Day of Atonement. Now, we don't, we don't have time to flip over there and, and go all the way through that, but that was the only day that anybody would what? The only day that anybody would come in here. Leviticus chapter 16. That was it. And it happened one day out of the year. And what did the priests have to do first? Okay, he had to do some purifying. He had to offer a sacrifice first for himself. But then the weird thing is he would come in, actually he would come into here with blood, and what would he do with that blood? Anybody remember? Yeah, he'd start sprinkling it all over the place. Throw some on here, some on there, let's throw some over there, let's do this. You know, he, he did all the things, and then he'd actually come in here, and he would sprinkle the blood right here on the mercy seat. Now here's the question, why is he doing that? Alright, so the question is, is it representative of when the blood was sprinkled on the altar and on the people? Uh, referring to Exodus 24 when the covenant was given. It's not, but I love the way your mind is thinking. And so does the Hebrews author, because you're doing exactly what he does, and you're taking these pieces and you're connecting them together. Uh, so, I, I love where you're going, um, but stay, staying strictly in Leviticus chapter 16, and, I mean, just go on down uh, just a little bit. Verse 22, what does he say about blood? Well, maybe not verse 22, hold on. Yeah, verse 22. Indeed, under the law of what? Everything is purified. In other words, the blood is a cleansing agent. That's the whole purpose of the blood on the Day of Atonement. He sprinkles the blood on these things in order to cleanse them from what? From sin, basically, right? From impurity. Well... How could there possibly be any impurity that takes place here, of all places? We still have two minutes, don't worry. Yeah, basically. Uh, Kelly said because it's on Earth. Consider this for just a second. Look, let me use this illustration. So I've still got about one and a half minutes, just so you know. So I'm going, going by the red clock. So, because uh, I'm going to need it. I'm going to use this illustration. I use it a lot. When I was in high school, I bet people thought that I smoked. I, I, I think they probably did. Because in my junior year, I would hop into the cab of a truck, and uh, you know, two buddies of mine, I'd sit between them, and uh, as soon as we started going, we, I lived like a minute from the school, but it took us 20 minutes to get there, because we'd cruise around and stop at the, you know, the store or whatever, get donuts. Anyway, they would light up cigarettes and they would smoke the entire time. Well, what do you think happens when I get out of the cab of that truck and I start walking around the halls of the high school? I bet people thought I smoked. I never smoked a single cigarette the entire time. I, like, you know, I've never done it before. But people probably assume that I did. Well, that's not fair, is it? How did it get on me? Because I was around it. I put myself in the midst of it. And in a sense, that's exactly what's happened here. This has been placed in the midst of a people who sin. In the midst of a people who are impure. And impurities abound. And every year, they need to come in and cleanse this. And then they get a couple goats, remember? And they take one of the goats, they offer it the other one. They, they kind of put all the unintentional sins of the people for the year. They stick it on his head and they send it outside the camp and send it away 
And, and therefore, for just this moment, things are nice and perfect until what happens? Until sin enters again. The job's not finished. It has to keep going again and again and again. Now, somebody remember for me next week, because I'm probably going to forget. Why is, you're going to ask this question, why is the high priest not allowed to go in here? Right? Somebody going to remember that question? I'm asking that question because I want to start with that next week. I want to have that, that discussion from Leviticus 16 because it's important. All right, but I won't remember. Thanks a lot, guys. We've got to cut it there. Now I'm about a minute over, so sorry, Richard. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot.